Good evening. I bring you greeting from the Claxton congregation, and uh, uh, they're probably glad to be rid of me tonight, so they send their thanks, I'm sure. Uh, it is good to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. It's been a few years, and uh, I'm glad to see that, that you're still here doing good work for the Lord, and I am uh, I'm delighted about that. I do have a, a couple questions, uh, Gary, I guess for you. What time do I need to be done? Quarter or ten to, and there will be a devotional after that, okay? Is that right? Or At the end of this, okay. Well, I'll... No, that's fine. I just, uh, I made some assumptions and I was wrong. Uh, that happens. Also, uh, I don't know how you've been approaching this, or am I the first one? Oh, well, uh, I, <clears throat> since this is a short series, right? In fact, it's interesting, this is the latest summer series I've ever done, I think, and there's still another one this month that uh, I'm going to be blessed to do uh, somewhere down in Middle Tennessee where a guy that I know preaches, and I'd never heard of those going on into September, but I think it's a good thing. I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of it. Uh, so I didn't know whether uh, we were approaching this as a class situation or what. Does it matter? I mean, I'm, I'm used to doing Bible class on Wednesday night, so I'm going to say if you'd like to make a comment, then feel free. Uh, that's just sort of how I had planned to approach it. And it is, again, it's a delight to be here. Uh, this, this topic, the church and prophecy, uh, Man, that's wide open. I mean, you know, we could, we could really be here all night and then some, and, and you're hoping that we won't be. So uh, let me just tell you how I plan to approach it. I want us to, to talk a little bit at first in a very general way about prophecy and about prophecies uh, that were made in the Old Testament and maybe why they come across the way that they do. And then we're going to just, as 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 long as we have time, we're just going to look at some of those great prophecies in the Old Testament that look forward to the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to know that what we are a part of is something that has been uh, thought of from eternity, isn't it? That it wasn't, as some people tend to claim, you know, an afterthought. And, uh, uh, and there are really people that believe that, people who believe that, that Christ is going to come and reign for a thousand years upon the earth. At least some of them, some varieties of that, uh, they believe that the church was just an afterthought. But I think if we don't already know that, we'll certainly know it after tonight. But I suspect that, that you are quite familiar with uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. Let me ask a question. <clears throat> Why is prophecy in general... And I mean, you know, Old Testament prophecy. Why is that important to us? You ever thought about that? There are reasons, probably more than, than I have listed here. I have a couple uh, that I think are, are very important reasons that prophecy is important in general. One is surely that prophecy is an important evidence for our faith. You know, when we talk about uh, the, the, the Christian faith, when we talk about the faith as it's revealed in the New Testament, that's not something that we're asked to believe blindly, is it? I know there are some people that think that if you believe in God and if you believe in Jesus and if you believe uh, that, that you know, his, the Bible is His Word, that you, you kind of just accept that and you believe it blindly, but that's not true. At least if you do, then you probably need to go back and, and, and reaffirm your own faith and, and decide why it is that you believe what you do. And I can tell you that there are good reasons to believe this. And one of them is the fact that so many things that are revealed to us in the New Testament were prophesied hundreds of years before. Uh, there are so many prophecies, for instance, about Jesus himself, uh, down to, to specific details of, of his earthly life. The fact that he was born of a virgin, that's prophesied in the book of Isaiah. The fact that he would be born in Bethlehem is prophesied in the book of Micah. And you know what's interesting about that is, uh, 
that's unexpected, isn't it? Who, where would folks have thought the Messiah would come from? Probably somewhere like Jerusalem. But no, the city of David, Bethlehem. And, and we could go on and on and talk about all of those things that were, that were fulfilled in, in specific detail that were prophesied hundreds of years before. That's an evidence of the faith. And it's not the case that somebody just sat down and, and wrote all this down at one time and pieced it all together and made it look a certain way because we know and we've known for some time that the Bible was written across the span of about uh, you know, 1,600 years. And so we have, uh, <clears throat> we have a, 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 a great evidence of, of our faith in, in prophecy, of the faith once for all delivered. But there's another reason I think that's very important. Have you thought of another one yet? How about our personal faith? Let me uh, take you to 1 Peter here. And, and, and Peter says some interesting things in chapter 1 of this book. You know, Peter's writing to people who are being persecuted and, and their faith is being put to the test. And so in chapter 1 of the book, he says some things that... Uh, really are designed to affirm their faith and, and to show them that their faith is not in vain. And I want you to listen to what he says, and we're going to draw a conclusion. He says in, in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of faith of uh, the power of God rather through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time in this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while if need be you've been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it be tested by fire may be found to praise honor and glory at the revelation of, of Jesus Christ whom having not seen you love by the way, that makes them kind of like us. This was a generation of Christians that had never seen Jesus. Not like Peter, who had, but they're like us, you know? I mean, uh, sometimes we say, well, if I could be like those Christians back in the Bible, I'd be a lot stronger. Well, here are some, and they're just like us, because they'd never seen Jesus. Whom having not seen him, you love him, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now watch this. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Now those last couple of verses there are interesting in that they tell us uh, several things. One is very important thing is that the prophets very often didn't fully understand what they were prophesying. If I understand what that verse says, it at least implies that, that you know they didn't always... Uh, understand fully what God was revealing through them. These are things that would not be fulfilled until many hundreds of years later. And in some cases, what they did understand was that they were actually ministering to people who'd not been born yet through these prophecies. Isn't that a fascinating thing? But here's, here's the, the, the thing I want to kind of connect the dots with here. He talks about this prophecy things that have now been fulfilled that, that the, the prophets desired to look into, the salvation of our souls. And he, he, he talks about those things that had been prophesied way back then. Many of them had been fulfilled by the time these people were reading what Peter wrote. Now, the reason that was so important to them is because Peter had just revealed to them a promise that God had made that had not been fulfilled yet. In fact, still hasn't been fulfilled. Back in verse 3 about this, uh, in verse 4, our inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, does not fade away, reserved in heaven. 
Well, that's still off in the future. It was for them. It is for us. How can I have confidence that God will deliver on that? Well, one way is because He has fulfilled so many prophecies that I can actually go and see the proof of. And that's a wonderful thing to, to, help, to help build our faith and uh, something to think about. But as we narrow this focus, what is, what's important about prophecies about the church? I've already really said it, but maybe it bears repeating. All of these prophecies about the church show us that the church was not an afterthought. It was something that God had planned and had been revealing for hundreds of years that there was going to be this, this, this body of believers and certain things about what that body was going to be like. And that's where we begin tonight to look at some of these uh, Old Testament prophecies about the church. And the first one, uh, if you had to guess, you might not guess this one, but I'm going to go to Psalm 2. If, if you don't mind, turn to the second Psalm. Now, in a lot of the Psalms, you have inscriptions that kind of tell you who wrote them. Like Psalm 3 says, a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. The publisher of your Bible didn't put that there. Uh, a scribe put that there, you know, many, many hundreds of years ago, back during Old Testament times. And so I tend to believe that those things are an accurate reflection of who wrote the psalm and what it was about. Psalm 2 doesn't have one of those, but I do know who wrote Psalm 2. Do you? You know who wrote Psalm 2? David did. And the way that you know that is you read Acts chapter 4, and when the apostles had been imprisoned and released and they prayed, they attributed Psalm 2 to David. Now listen to what he, he says. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in His wrath and distress them in His deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is God's answer to the rebellion of the world in that time and I think for all times. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Who would say that? Who is David speaking for here? Yeah, who's the son of God? Jesus, right? Ask of me, and here, here's, the, here's the verse I want to pay particular attention to. This is a psalm about about. The Messiah, because the apostle said that it was. And he mentions, you know, uh, the Lord himself saying, uh, the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I've begotten you. The New King James translators even put uh, you in, in capital Y-O-U to denote that that's a reference to Christ. But look at verse 8. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. If you read on in verse 9, there's a picture of judgment, you know, being dashed to pieces with a with a like a potter's vessel, breaking them with a rod of iron. But this in, in verse 8, there's more than one way that we could imagine that God granted Jesus the nations for his inheritance. Where do you think I'm going with this? How did, is there any sense in which Christ has already received the nations for his inheritance? Well, let's skip over to another prophecy. This one I know you're familiar with. When, when I think of the, the great Old Testament prophecies of the church, this is the one that pretty much comes to the top of the list for me, and it's Isaiah chapter 2. Listen to... What Isaiah writes, beginning in verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations. See that? All nations shall flow unto it. <clears throat> 
Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the Lord of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways. We shall walk in His paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now, this is a, a grand prophecy. It's a wonderful prophecy about the church. And there are a number of things that we learn from this that actually help us with other things in the Bible. One of them that I want to mention is the fact that in verse 2 it says that this would come to pass in the latter days. How does that help us with other things that we read in the Bible? What do you often hear today when people talk about biblical prophecies of the latter days? How do a lot of people interpret that? What do they take that to mean? Yeah, as, as long as I've lived on this earth, you know, all of my something-something years, uh, nearly twice years, I, I'm afraid to say, I have heard in, in about, in every decade, I've heard somebody interpret biblical prophecy as, as pointing, you know, this, you know, prophecies just like this one and others that talk about the last days and the latter days, pointing to, uh, uh, you know, the, the end of time, and, and usually that is spun to mean that it's going to happen very soon. It's the present time. There are preachers on TV right now, probably tonight at this time, <laughs> saying things like that. And especially with things heating up in the Middle East, and I don't know, things are always heating up in the Middle East. And so there's always somebody who is, who's going to interpret these biblical prophecies uh, to be relating to the end of time. But is that, is that what this is talking about? What is the, what, what's the latter days? What is that? We were just in 1 uh, in Peter and if I have the right scripture reference, then I want to go back and look at something. And if I don't, I'm going to be really embarrassed. But this isn't the only thing, <clears throat> the only place we'll find it. Yeah, later on in that chapter that we were just reading from down here, talking about Jesus in verse 20 of 1 Peter 1, it says, He was indeed foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, look at it, in these last times. For you. That's not the only place. You know, the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, talks about how uh, God had communicated His will to men in different ways in the past. But listen, listen to what uh, the Hebrews writer says here. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, has in these last days, these last days, spoken to us by His Son. And that's not the only place. In fact, uh, hopefully we're going to get to see another biblical prophecy of the church that very <laughs> specifically defines what the last days are. But if we had to stop here, this would be sufficient, wouldn't it, to show that the last days are, are what? What are these last days? How is it that somebody writing nearly 2,000 years ago could say, these are the last days. Well, the Lord hasn't come yet. How could they say that? I'll give you a clue, because the Lord hasn't come yet. You see? And the last days are, are the Christian age, simply the, the church. The last days are the age of the church. Uh, that's one way to put it. And so, uh, back to Isaiah 2, listen to what, how this church is described. It is described as, as the mountain of the Lord's house, later on specifically the house of the God of Jacob, established on the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. What do you think is the significance of that? The fact that it's established on the top of the mountains. There are... There are uh, references in the Old Testament to ruling powers as being mountains, like Babylon was called a, a mountain of destruction, I think. 
And so it seems to me that what's being said here is that the church is established on the top of the mountains, meaning that the kingdom of God, which is embodied in the church as it is here on earth, uh, is exalted above all of the other kingdoms. You are a, a citizen of the most important kingdom there is, that there's ever been. The, the kingdom of God that we also know as the church. It is in fact exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Does that remind you of any New Testament scriptures? Probably reminds you of several. What did Jesus tell his apostles the last time he was in their presence bodily before he was ascended to heaven? We know it as the Great Commission. Go therefore and teach all nations or make disciples of all nations. All nations. That's, you know, all nations. Now what was peculiar about that probably to a Jew living in Isaiah's time in around 800 B.C. is that, well, God had one nation and that was, uh, that was the Hebrews. It was the, the Jewish nation. And yet, here's this prophecy that talks about all nations will flow into this, uh, this Lord's house that's established on the top of the mountains. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways, and we shall walk in His paths. Well, that should ring familiar to us. We go there on purpose. God doesn't conscript us into it. You're not born into it when you're born the first time. And it's, it's, it's something that, that you do purposefully. And when you're there, you are taught the ways of God. And we shall walk in His paths. What's another word for that? That's obedience, right? The church is, is a body of people who are purposefully... And, uh, and intelligently or instructively obedient. That's what's being described here. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Where did the church start? In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost? That's really the first time we have the, the gospel preached as historical fact, right? And that's when the church began. That's when God started adding the saved together in this body. That's when men started obeying the gospel of Christ that added them to Christ and to His body. And that's when the church began. It began in Jerusalem, just like Isaiah said it would. It says that He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. What is going to be the thing that decides whether anybody, no matter what nationality they are, is going to be okay in God's eyes or not. Remember what Jesus said, John 12, 48? He that rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last day. This word that goes forth from Jerusalem, this law of God, this perfect law of liberty that goes forth from Jerusalem in those early days of the church, and we have it today in our New Testament. That's the judgment. That's how God's going to judge the nations. It's not going to be something based on some, something political. It's not going to be based on, on any other factor, but, but how we have uh, aligned ourselves with, with God's Word, with God's revealed will. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now that's where I think a lot of people get tripped up because they look at that and they think, well, you know, that hasn't ever happened yet. You know, there's never been peace on the earth since that time. So this must be something that hasn't been fulfilled yet. But in what context is Isaiah talking about where there would be peace? What's that? 
Yeah, in, in the church, in, in the context of, of the church, the kingdom of God. Let me illustrate that for you. Uh, you know, the, just the fact that in the New Testament, you know, it was revealed that Jew and Gentile would come together in one body. That was a big enough thing. People back then couldn't even imagine that. But have you ever, have you ever paid a, attention to a list of the apostles of, of Jesus Christ and who they were? There were, there were two in particular that were interesting to have been in that group together. There was one Simon, not Simon Peter, but, but one they called Simon the Zealot. You remember reading that? Simon the Zealot. What, what, do you know what a zealot was? When we talk about a zealot today, we use it in a very you know, generic sense. Somebody who's very zealous about something, maybe in some cases excessively so. But in the first century, zealots were people... Were, were, were Jews who were very opposed to you know, the Jews having anything to do with the Roman Empire. They were very, uh, very strictly and stringently nationalistic. And then Jesus called this other guy to be an apostle. You know who I'm thinking of? He has two names in, in Scripture. One is Levi, one is Matthew. And Matthew was a tax collector. And they didn't like tax collectors, but they didn't like them for a different reason than we don't like them. And if anybody here works for the IRS, I, I don't mean anything by that. But uh, um, I, once, I know somebody that works for the IRS, and, and you know I was glad to know it before I started saying things like that in her presence one time. But uh, the tax collectors in the first century, you know, that, that work was kind of farmed out by the Roman Empire, to people uh, that they occupied, like the Jews. And, and Matthew was a Jew who was collecting taxes for the Romans. And then you got this guy, this Simon the Zealot. Those two would never have gotten together in the same room uh, without some angst, I would think, in any other context. But look at them in the peaceable kingdom of Jesus Christ. I, I don't know if there was never any tension between them at first, but I do know that uh, I don't read of anything like that. I don't read that, that they didn't get along because of the peace with which Jesus had established his kingdom. Um, very quickly, just some observations about this passage. Uh, first of all, let's look at a, a couple uh, you say 15 till or 10 till? Oh, good. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know better than that. Uh, <clears throat> I was out of town a few weeks ago, and Brother James Meadows came and spoke in my place at Claxton and got done at like 15 till 11, and I never heard the end of that. Still haven't heard the end of that. All right. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, now you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Doesn't that sound a lot like the kind of thing that Isaiah is talking about there? And then when he talks about you know, the mountain of the Lord's house being established on top of the mountains, in 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul talks about how the church of God is the house of God. The house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And there are a number of other passages that we could look at. But I want to notice just some observations before we leave this passage. It shows that the church crosses national boundaries and and it, 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 it's meant to. We cannot, we cannot have prejudices based upon nationality and race in, in the church. Not if we're going to live up to what God, even long ago in prophecy, established. And uh, not only that, there's the emphasis in the passage upon teaching God's ways, being obedient to Him. And it's also interesting to me, and maybe I'm making too much out of this, but just at least by way of application, I want to notice that the nations flow into 
the church and not the other way around. You know, whenever you see references to, to, to that, you see the idea that people come into the church. And what that means is they come into that which Christ has already established. Christ regulates. Christ defines and sets the boundaries for and not the other way around. Too many times people want to take the church and make it fit whatever their peculiarities are, you know. Wow, there's even, there's even, a, there's even a, a denomination that caters to the homosexual movement. Uh, there's, I think, a local body of it in Knoxville. That's an extreme example, but, you know, you ever listen to people talk about why they go to church where they do? And more importantly, why they don't go to church where they don't? Because I like this and I don't like that. And yet, God says, here's my house, you flow into it. And you will learn the ways of God and you will be obedient. That's what Isaiah establishes there. So it's interesting to me that not only do we have certain technical aspects of the church defined even in prophecy there, but there's that one thing that is set forth is the idea that the church is to be obedient. There are the responsibilities of, of you and me as, as individual members of the kingdom are, are kind of set forth there in very general terms. I don't ever want to look at a passage of Scripture, a prophecy that's you know, regarding the church only in the context of refuting some false doctrine. It does that. But when I read those things, what I'm also seeing is the fact that God revealed centuries before it became a reality upon the earth, God revealed His, well, His expectations for His people. Not only here, uh, but other places as well. And so, uh, <clears throat> one other that, that we'll look at is, oh, it's hard, it's hard to pick one, you know, um, Let's look at Amos chapter 9. Now, this is one I'm going to confess to you that I, I don't, don't understand the ins and outs of as, maybe as well as I do some, and I don't understand all of them uh, like I need to. But it's pretty well agreed that this is a prophecy of the Messianic age, the church, Verse 11 of, of Amos 9 says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages, and I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing? Uh, and you know, there are other things said later on, but you know, a lot of people will look at that and they'll say, oh, you know, they're going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and they're going to restore animal sacrifices and all that. People that subscribe to various premillennial theories, but uh, that's not what is being talked about there. In fact, in the book of Acts, when there was discussion about you know, Gentiles entering the church, in Acts chapter 15... Beginning in verse 13, listen to the passage that was quoted. It says, After they'd become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. And so you know, that, that passage was talking not about a literal rebuilding of the tabernacle, but the tabernacle prefigured the church. So did the temple. And uh, again, in, in 1 Peter, this time in chapter 2, listen to how Peter describes the church. Um, beginning in verse 4. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You know, Christ was rejected as the, and he's become the chief cornerstone. 
You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Peter describes us as, well, as a temple that are built stone upon stone. The church is the building when you think about the right building. You know, we always say the church isn't the building, and that's true. The church isn't this place where we are, but the church is the building that God has built out of each individual soul that makes up this temple, each living stone. We are the building. So the building isn't the church, but the church is the building. It is God's building. I want to share one other thing with you tonight by way of invitation. There's another feature of the New Testament church, and that is the covenant that, that guides it, that, uh, that secures it, that you know, grants it uh, those things that are most important. And, and, and you remember what Jeremiah said, and this is quoted in Hebrews 8 to show that it's been fulfilled in, in the New Testament. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, to my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. So much there about uh, what, what it's like to be a part of the new covenant, to be a part of the church. And that is that God's law is written on our hearts. And we don't teach people to know the Lord because in order to become a part of the church, you have to learn about the Lord first. You become a part of His church by, by learning of Him, by knowing of Him, and by beginning to, to, to know Him in that obedient way through our obedience to the gospel of Christ. But it's this last thing that I want to focus on tonight. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. That is the feature of the new covenant, that is the blessing to the church that we want never to take for granted, God's forgiveness of sin. We had a death in our congregation yesterday, a very good and godly man that has, uh, will be missed by many who served the Lord right up through the very last of his 83 years. But he wasn't a perfect man. But I'm confident that today, if, if I know anything about him, he is, uh, he is enjoying the blessing of a place of comfort, not because of his own goodness, though he was a good man, but because of his faith in Jesus Christ who says, their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Well, God says that, and the reason is because the blood of Jesus Christ can be applied to our sins, that we might be forgiven. And because Jesus died to satisfy the demands of God's justice, we can rest in that forgiveness. Now, you might not know that forgiveness yet tonight, but I hope that it will be your aim and purpose to know it, to, to, to enjoy it, to, to, to grab hold of it. But not just any old way. The Lord says that we must come to Him uh, in faith, you know, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Lord says we need to turn from our lives of sin and turn toward God in repentance. And then, of course, we confess out loud that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God and then we are immersed, baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins and raised to walk in a new life. That's how it's described in Romans chapter 4. You know, I've heard people say, I don't know what baptism has to do with the gospel. They've ne Romans chapter 6, rather. They've never read Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, if they say that. Because baptism is the very portrait of the gospel. It's where we reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ.
the gospel. And then Paul says it is then that we are resurrected to a new life, raised to walk in newness of life. That's happened to you if you have become a Christian according to God's command. But if you've done that and it's no longer the aim of your life to be pleasing to Him, then you're no longer really walking in that new life. But God always invites us to come home to Him, to confess our sins and to turn away from them once again. And He promises that He'll forgive by that same blood of Jesus that cleansed us when we were baptized. If that's your need tonight, whatever we can do to help you, we hope you'll come while we stand and sing. On behalf of the Lawnville Road Church of Christ, I want to thank you for joining us today for our worship. If you ever have an opportunity, we invite you to join us at our physical location at 1301 Lawnville Road in Kingston, Tennessee. We hope you will come and experience the simplicity of New Testament Christianity to learn about God and to become a part of His family. If you have questions, if you would like to know more about the Bible, or if you would like a home Bible study, feel free to contact us by calling 865-717-0444. Or for more information, please visit our website at www.lawnvilleroadcoc.org. Again, we thank you, and we hope you have a blessed day.